turn this morning to the Song of Solomon, book of the Song of Solomon. If you find the beginning of Isaiah and work backwards, you'll find Song of Solomon chapter 2. Song of Solomon chapter 2. We've been going through this book for our communion meditations, aiding us and helping us in, in consideration of our Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for us as we remember Him at the table our study in First Thessalonians at times is much more practical and I, your, your mind gets drawn in a certain direction, certain subject, certain topic, and then to come around you'd nearly need another meditation uh, for the preparation of our minds at the table. But by doing it in the fashion we are, which is every first Lord's Day of the month in the morning, as we observe the Lord's table, we come to this book and just work our way through it for the help and direction we need in how we should think as we come to the table of the Lord on any given occasion. So we are in chapter 2, that's as far as we are at present, and we're going to read the opening seven verses of this, and I trust the Lord will help us as we read the Word, and then as we consider it together. So let us hear the Word of God. Let us even consider the tremendous privilege we have in the fact that the Word is here before us in our mother tongue. And may the Lord, by His Spirit, instruct our hearts. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat, I, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O daughters, of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the seventh verse. Let's still our hearts momentarily in prayer. Let's all seek the Lord. Our Father, we simply want to be prepared to sit at the table with the frame of mind that we ought to have, a frame of mind of worship and adoration, of repentance of privilege, sensing all that has been accomplished by the Lord Jesus and being brought to adore Him and praise Him and consider Him. So we pray that as we have the Word open before us and we give consideration to the themes that are here, that Thou wilt be pleased to open up the Scriptures and truly bless our hearts and just cause our minds to be directed on those things that are conducive to praise and adoration. We want, it, we want to sit at thy feet and hear thy word. And we pray that it might please thee to just come alongside and help each one of us. Bless then those that will hear the word. Bless the preacher. I pray for thy help. I ask, Lord, for thy, for thy promised Holy Ghost, for he has been given to aid preachers, to aid those who declare Christ. We ask that his aid will be very evident and known by us all and that we might be fed upon the finest of the wheat. So come, bless the Spirit of God. Condescend, saving and restoring and blessing all that are gathered here this day, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we have said on the various occasions that we have been looking at this book coming to our communion seasons, I have made it clear that we are taking the classic Reformed and Puritan understanding of the Song of Solomon. I say that again just briefly at the outset this morning so that if you're in here and you have been taught another way or you've read some other book that takes this as a manual for marriage and human relationships, that you'll not be completely confused when I begin to expound the passage from a completely different perspective, that you will see that we are taking it in the form of the allegory that those before us took it as they sought to understand the teaching of this 
portion of the Word of God. We've made arguments for our reasons in relation to that already. I'll not go over old ground. But John Owen, the English Puritan, a tremendous theologian of the past, he said concerning the Song of Solomon, quote, This book, this whole book rather, is taken up in the description of the communion that is between the Lord Christ and His saints. This whole book is taken up in the description of the communion that is between the Lord Christ and His saints. And that simple quotation from John Owen highlights and drives home the point that we're making and, and the application and understanding of this passage of the Word of God as we come to it each time we, we approach the table of the Lord. It is a look, a unique look in some ways, at the depth of communion between believers and their Lord. And as such, it ought to drive home to our hearts the experience of communion with the Savior and the importance of that depth of communion, that it is not enough for any one of us to be content merely with some profession of faith, but that there is a deep communion between each one that professes faith in Christ as they live out their lives before the Lord, that there is a communion, there's a connection, there is His Word coming to you, Him sending a Spirit to you, and you in turn having a relationship with Him, communing with Him, sharing your heart with Him, magnifying Him for all that He has done for you in the sending of His Son. There's a two-way communication that is going on with every born-again believer and their Savior and their God. We have to lament far too often, however, that that communion is not what it ought to be. And indeed, that lamentation, that, that deep sense of lamentation, that sense of something not being right in terms of communion with God is, in fact, an indication of the root of the matter being there within your life. The one who's never been born of the Spirit, the one who knows nothing of genuine saving grace, tends to go through life with little concern over the fact that they don't have a communion with the Lord. They don't have fellowship with God. But even if we come and we're found this morning in the house of God in a poor state of communion, where there isn't an ongoing experience and, and fellowship with the Lord and where we must admit that I'm, I'm really not where I ought to be, the fact that you're bothered by that is an indication of the fact that you do know the Lord. It's one of the evidences. When people come to me sometimes for counsel, and this is their problem, that's a lack of assurance, things that relate to a lack of assurance, they're concerned about, about what's going on in their lives and their lack of interest in things of Christ is a common conversation. It happens regularly. You have these discussions with people. One of the things I, I, I try to help them to see, the fact that you're bothered by this is strong evidence of the, of, of the need not to worry about what you're worrying about. Because the worry is, do I really know the Lord? Am I really saved? The fact you're concerned about that because there's the absence of fellowship is in some ways, certainly is one of the evidences of the fact that you know the Lord. The Lord has done a work in your heart. And the fact that you're then concerned is a work of His Spirit within your life. So as we sit at the table of the Lord, it is about communion. It is about fellowship. It's not just sitting here and going through it. It's about fellowship. It's a reflection of that fellowship that we have, that we enjoy in Christ. It is the Lord calling us aside from our normal duties of life. And He is saying, look, fellowship with me. This, this is a reminder to you because you're apt to forget. You're apt to drift through life and, and not be aware of the deep sense of fellowship that you are to enjoy. But I want to enjoy that fellowship. I desire that fellowship with you, so I am calling you, remember me in this appointed way. Sit down at the table and participate in the fashion that has been appointed. So as we come to the opening verses of chapter 2, we're, we're just continuing this theme. that This is what the book is about. It's about communion. It's about the Lord's fellowship with the church, with His people. Individually, corporately, the application is there in both ways, but it's about fellowship between the Lord and his church. And we're considering then the love between lilies. The love between lilies. And we're just drawing from the opening language there as we consider first in this the imagery of love. Then we'll see the imagery of fellowship. And then we will also see the imagery of security. So let us see first of all the imagery of love in verses 1 and 2. I am the rose of Sharon, it is recorded. 
and the lily of the valleys, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. These first verses have divided opinion. In fact, many modern translations, and you may have one before you, uh, will, will reflect the fact that verse 1 really belongs to the preceding verses of the end of chapter 2. So in verses 16 and 17, you have the church, essentially, the bride, communing with the Lord in that sense, and verse 1 is, is, is put in along with that. So this is the church saying, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. Here is what the believer is reflecting to the Lord. A statement by the bride, but, but this has not been the normal understanding of verse 1. In fact, the very hymn that we sang last indicated that it's the Lord that says He's the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And that has been debated. It has been opposed, and some have said, well, no, this is, this is the language of the bride. But again, most Reformed and Puritan commentators of the past regarded verse 1 as the language of the bridegroom. It's, it's, it's the Lord Himself speaking here and drawing attention to himself. And as usual, I side with the older scholars. I think they had it right. The Lord is saying in verse 1, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. He draws attention to himself, liking himself in, in these ways. And then in verse 2, he draws attention to the church where he says, as a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. He uses here uh, an I am statement. It's, at least it's how it's recorded for us the sense of what the Lord is. And when we read that, again, we, we understand the Lord Jesus was never shy to use terms of what He is and, and draw from the world in making statements of, of what He is. And so when we read through the Gospels, we know that He claimed to be the light of the world, the bread of life, the good shepherd, and He preceded those statements with, I am, I am these things. And here, in the Old Testament Scriptures, we have another statement that essentially is drawing a similar idea. I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valleys. Here is what I am. And there are truths that are being communicated through the imagery that is being put here before us. Now what's the rose of Sharon? Well, the rose of Sharon was that beautiful plain on the Mediterranean coast. and It, it, was, a, it was an imagery that would have been familiar with those that would be reading this originally. And they would be understanding, therefore, that there's a scene of beauty. A scene of beauty is being painted before us. And Christ elevates His own beauty in using this language, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. He's, he's drawing our minds to see the beauty of Himself, depicting Himself as the most beautiful flower in the most beautiful plain, the rose of Sharon. And then the lily of the valleys as well is also that, one of the most attractive flowers in all of nature. I know there's argument over the type of lily and so on, but there's certainly a sense in which the Lord here is is drawing out something beautiful, not going into the, the various aspects of the, the, the horticulture of it all in terms of what lily it was and what it looked like and what color it was, but I see our brother, Mr. Pinkson, smiling at the back. This is maybe some area where he would have some expertise. But the idea, the sense of the idea is beauty, is beauty. And the Lord is drawing out and drawing attention to His own beauty. Of course, I find it interesting that Solomon is recording this at least in terms of the translation anyway, if the lily is the same lily that the Lord referred to, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, that here Solomon is recording that very thing that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is as the lily of the valleys, but Solomon wasn't. Solomon himself did not have a beauty like that, but the Lord, the Lord himself and this portion shows that he has a beauty that supersedes the beauty of all the glorious things of the world, even that Solomon had, and all the glory of his own achievements and attainments in this world. You see, Jesus Christ is the most glorious thing in the world. He is. When he draws attention to himself here in this way, and he, he wants us to see the beauty in it, I mean, we stand at times, at least some of us, we will like to appreciate nature, and some more so than others, and I have, I've lamented this in the past, that I, I don't have that poetic strain that looks at nature and really can, can see as the poet sees the world. I, I, I wish I had more of that. Maybe it's something that can be cultivated and I should put more effort into it. But I, I appreciate that sense that people have that when they look at the world, they see something far more 
than perhaps the average person sees just in terms of the life of what exists before them and what they can see in terms of color. They see more deeply than that. And the hymn writer brings this out, does he not, when he talks about something lives after Christ comes into the heart, something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen. That even the creation itself takes on more glory and more beauty whenever we have a genuine converted experience when we are born of the Spirit of God. But so it is for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is lamented by the prophet in Isaiah 53 that there is no beauty in Him that we should desire Him. And again, like the unconverted heart or like those that cannot see the beauty of creation, they look at the world and plainly just see it for the life that it is, but they see no real beauty in it all. In fact, the whole philosophy of our day, the, the driving influences of our generation are, are seeking to help people or encourage people and, and make people believe that all of this is by chance, that everything before us is just randomly put together and there's no creative glory in it at all. And he, 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 in fact, when you come to that logic, when, when you remove God from the, the, the very establishment of the world, when you remove that fact He made everything, and everything is random chance, then essentially there is no such thing as beauty itself anyway. It's all, it's all again, it's, it's purely in the eye of the beholder, and even there he has to, the, the beholder has to question whether or not it's as, as beautiful as he really perceives. Because it's random. It's, it's just the, the product of chaos. And he cannot be assured that anything is, has that real sense of beauty in the fact that it has been ordered in a certain way and, and made in a certain way and the colors come together particularly in a fashion that is designed to reflect beauty and glory. You, you, you remove God even, even trying to have any... Even art itself doesn't really exist in any meaningful sense. Art has meaning and has sense because we know God made all things beautiful and glorious in the way that He made them. And all forms of art, musical or whatever, all forms of beauty, find their, their sense of beauty because we know God made it in that way. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is aware of beauty. He, 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 he has no problem with the fact that certain things are beautiful. And drawing from nature, He says, I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valleys. And as a person would look upon the rose of Sharon and look upon the lily of the valleys and marvel at the beauty there, so it is for the child of God. They ought to, in fact, they're being encouraged by this portion to look at Christ and see the beauty of the Son of God. We are to be a people that are attracted to Him. That see the beauty in Him, that we should desire Him. And His observation then of us, the, what the Spirit of God records in terms of what the Lord would say to His church is, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. And, and they take on a certain beauty that the Lord Himself has. As the lily among thorns. As He is the lily of the valleys, there is the lily among thorns. <laughs> Again, this is, this is not uncommon. The Lord Himself says, I am the light of the world, but then He also says, ye are the light of the world. There are aspects of, of me and what I'm about that can be seen in you and ought to be seen in you. And so the beauty of the lily ought to be seen in the people of God as well, in the church, in those that love Him and adore Him and know Him. There's something of, of His beauty that can be reflected by them and ought to be reflected by them. As the lily among thorns, of course, they're among thorns. Thorns speak of the curse, don't they? Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 the Lord says there, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thorns. <laughs> and every gardener knows the thorns and the thistles. They know that constant battle in the world. In fact, I've said to people, when they talk about weeding and so on, I said, well, just, just remember, every time you go out to weed, you're being reminded of the fall and of our need for Jesus Christ. Every time. Every time you lament the fact that you've made it all perfect and proper and, and you've been very particular about everything and edging everything and putting these things in their place and then, of course, the monsters of, of weeds come up and try to, 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 to ruin your work and the artistic endeavor you've seek, sought to apply in showing the beauty of the things that you've planted. 
every time you get, in, get involved in that, there, there's a message that's coming to you. Again, it's not clear enough for the ignorant to understand it. But for you that know the Word of God, when you're, when you're battling with, with the, the weeds, as it were, with the thorns and the thistles, you're being taught and instructed again that you live in a fallen world and you need a Savior. You need, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. And so parents, whenever you send your kids out to do the weeding and they complain, you, tell, you remind them, well, this is communicating the gospel to you and you're in need of the Lord Jesus Christ and you need to go out there and weed so that you're reminded that you live in a fallen world and you're fallen as well and you need the Lord. And you can blame me then for <laughs> suggesting that and uh, me putting that in your mind if you haven't used that argument already. Yes, we're among thorns. There's the church in verse 2. What, what, what an apt description, in fact, even as we come to the Lord's table. This is not that final supper, is it? We're awaiting a final supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and feast there with all the church and all the ransomed. But here, it is not as it will be then. Here there are thorns. The curse is all around us. Indeed, something of the influence of that curse is even in us. Thorns. The world, you see, that's, that's, that's really what the thorns are. As the earth brings forth the thorns against everything that is, man seeks to do and all that is good and right, God made the world and said, it's good. It's all very good. Man falls and then thorns come up and it's not good. It is not good. And so among the, thillies, which, uh, the lilies, which is good, there are these thorns that grow up and they're seeking to choke the life out of the lily. This is what life is like in this world. For the church militant, for the church upon the earth, we are battling constantly. In fact, is it not true the Lord uses this imagery of thorns even in his, one of his most famous parables, when he, the parable of the sower as we know it. As recorded in Matthew 13, when it refers to that certain ground that's choked by the thorns, he says also that that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. You see the thorns and the world being pulled together. The imagery is that of thorns choking out the life. But the application in terms of the church is that those thorns are the world and that world chokes life out of the seed that has been sown. Thorns, the world, they are brought together there most powerfully in Matthew 13 by our Lord Jesus Christ. And that then is the imagery we see in verse 2. The lily is among thorns. The church lives in a world that's seeking to choke the life that the Lord has put within it. The beauty of Christ that exists in every genuine child of God, every redeemed child of God, that beauty is under constant pressure. You know it within your own soul. There is a beauty in the church of that, there is no doubt. The Lord redeems us, sanctifies us, changes us, transforms us. We are not what we once were by His grace. But it is not an easy road. It is not without its conflict. And the conflict of the child of God, the conflict of the church is described here in terms of thorns. As a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. My love, that chosen particular love the Lord has for His church, for His people, that love for that particular lily. Yet that lily exists among thorns. The Lord keeps us in the world. He spoke of this in John 17, did He not? In verse 14 and 15, the Lord Jesus records in His high priestly prayer, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. But here's what He prays. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. What a prayer. The Lord ultimately, and you read on in the prayer, and you see His desire that they be with Him where He is, that they may behold His glory. That's the end. That's the destination. That's where it's going. But presently, His prayer for His church is, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. 
In other words, the Lord is praying even now that the lily would not be taken from among the thorns. The lily has an existence and purpose among the thorns. And beloved, you have a purpose in your existence here in the world among the thorns. Those thorns of unbelievers that are around you in your workplace and in your neighborhood and those that despise you and hate you even within your own family. You have a purpose being a lily among those thorns. There's a reason the Lord has you in amongst those particular thorns. We look at the day in which we live, the thorny experience of living in the 21st century in North America. We look back to other days, days that seem brighter, days that seem better for whatever reasons. And they may be better in some ways, but they're worse than others. (laughs) I always like to just keep myself humble as I look back and see something of the the climate that others lived in, times of revival and God coming down, and you, you, you kind of wish you were there and had a taste of it. But at the same time, if you go back too far, there are other things that you begin to benefit this life, and this maybe shows my carnality. But I, but I immediately think of, of uh, maybe having an, uh, needing a root canal or something. I'm being very, very, very glad that I live in the 21st century where you can get anesthetic. You can, you can be numbed from the pain and appreciate some of the advancements in, in science and so on. And it just, there's a reason why we live now. And we are not to look back to other days and, and kind of wish away our lives and our existence. We are to realize the Lord has the lily among these thorns now. You're existing now among thorns. You don't desire those thorns. You don't delight in those thorns. You don't even like them very much. But you're there in the thorns. You're in the prickly experience of your life, your existence, here and now. That's where you are in God's perfect providence for your life. And so you come to the table of the Lord today and you have the thorns. You have, let's just put it this way, you have the effects of the curse and the fall surrounding you. And yet the Lord would still call the lily to come and sit and dine with him. Psalm 23 sums it up so well when it's put in these words that thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. In the midst of the thorns. In the midst of the thorns he prepares a table for me that I may sit and commune with him. I don't know what particular aspects of the thorny world in which we live that you're under at present certain unpleasant experiences of the fall that you're in this morning. But there's one thing we can certainly be thankful for, that we're lilies among thorns and not the thorns themselves. Whatever goes on in life, at least we're, we are the lily. We have something of the beauty of the Lord Jesus that is upon us. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Distinct, different, not like the rest, not like the world in which she lives and exists. This is you, child of God, this is you. Christ set his love upon you that you might be a lily among thorns. Embrace it. (laughs) Don't embrace the thorns necessarily. Don't, Don't do that. Don't become part of the thorns, but embrace the fact that you're a lily among thorns. That's where you are. This is life as the Lord has appointed it for us until He calls us into glory. Spurgeon noted that God uses lilies to turn thorns into lilies. That's the power of Christian testimony. A lily among the thorns can be used to transform the very thorns themselves by evangelism, by personal life and testimony to the gospel itself. Secondly then, note with me not only the imagery of love, but the imagery of fellowship. There's an imagery of fellowship here. While the Lord shows His love toward His people and reflects that love by identifying the distinguishing mark that they have taking on his characteristic and being a lily among thorns there's then fellowship that develops in verses 3 and 4 
Verse 3 we read, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And we'll get to verse 4 in due course. These thoughts are of the bride concerning the bridegroom. She is now reflecting her heart concerning him. And note with me here in this fellowship, first, the place to consider in this fellowship, the place to consider is as the apple tree among the trees of the wood. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood. Now, again, I'm no expert in horticulture, but apple trees don't generally belong in woods. <clears throat> apple trees belong in orchards. And it would be a very strange thing, usually, to go through a wood and find an apple tree in the middle of it. Usually, it would have no existence there. It would have no place there. But this is what she says concerning him. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. As he has reflected what she is, a lily among thorns, now she in turn reflects what he is in the midst of the world. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the thorns. The place of fellowship then is this place of, 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 of a wood, of darkness, of difficulty, and yet, and yet he is there in the midst of the darkness of the wood where we'd expect all those trees that make up the wood, all the evergreens or so on, whatever it might be, that would, would cut out all the light and, and remove all life at all. There is this apple tree that stands there in the midst, and, and that is what he is to her as an apple tree. It stands out again, again like a lily among thorns. You, you, your eye is drawn to the lily. And as an apple tree among the trees of the wood, your eye is drawn to the apple tree. Then she sees the beauty of him and where this place will take, this fellowship will take place. One would expect, again, the apple tree to be in an orchard. That's the imagery of heaven. It's the perfect environment. It's walled. Not that the fire will enter in. But that's not where this apple tree is. This apple tree is in the wood. Again, it's a, a picture of the world and its darkness. And Christ, you see, came into this world. He condescended. He didn't have continually in His existence this walled up orchard staying up in heaven. In order to redeem His people, He had to come into the place of darkness. He had to come to the heart of the wood, as it were, to address the needs of His people. What wonderful imagery there is here. There's not only the place to consider in this fellowship, there's also the person to consider in this fellowship. Woods, as we've said already, tend to be dark and shadowy areas, just like this world cursed by the fall. But one apple tree in the midst of the woods is conveying the sense of uniqueness. There's nothing else like it. It's one apple tree in the midst of the wood. It, there's no other like it. It's, it's standing there on its own, unique in the world. And this is our Lord Jesus Christ, unique in the world. Yes, He took our flesh. Yes, Yes, he, he became man and dwelt among us. Yes, people looked at him and, and did not understand there was any distinction. Is not this the carpenter, the carpenter's son, as it was sometimes put? Is, is he not just one of us, just walking amongst us, living his life? But again, to those eyes that have had the scales removed, and the Lord has stepped in and given his redemptive his redemptive grace and their hearts have been transformed and the scales have been um, taken from their eyes. They, they begin to see that in this world, in the wood of this world, there was an apple tree. An apple tree. So unique. So distinct. And there's also then the provision. Because... She sat down, you see that in verse 3? I sat down under his shadow. I sat down under his shadow. Of course, she's speaking in terms of the past, isn't she? I sat down under his shadow. This is something she did. This again is like the believer who for the first time sees that there, there's salvation in the Lord. And they turn to Christ and they, they call out for him to have mercy upon them. Christ, for the first time in their lives, becomes that apple tree in the midst of the wood. They've been running around through their lives trying to find salvation here, there, and yonder, trying to find peace and happiness and contentment, and they didn't find it no matter how hard they looked. And they can say, 
with the scriptures and the hymn writer that they, they tried the broken cisterns, but ah, the waters failed. Time and time again, there was no genuine satisfaction. But she looks back, she considers the past. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. Oh, beloved, when you think back to what the Lord did for you in saving you, I trust there's a measure of delight. No matter what you're facing today, no matter what providence is bringing across your path, when you hurt back, if you were to ask, you are to rather get up and give testimony to what the Lord did for you, that it would not be a miserable testimony of the Lord's grace in your life, that there would be a sense of joy. Some of God's people go through many sorrows. Indeed, many, if not all of God's people, go through many sorrows. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But when they look back to the time and hour when they were saved, is there not a joy? Is there not a joy associated with that moment you believed? And we sing the hymn and understand what it means. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. We understand what the hymn writer is communicating there. This change has brought joy. And so she looks back. I sat under his shadow with great delight. There was delight and joy. Provision again under his shadow. The provision is, can be seen in different ways, of course. It's refuge, isn't there? Under his shadow, there's refuge there. She's hiding there. She comes for refuge under him. And of course, why would she be seeking refuge? Well, like maybe there's a clearing in this wood, as it were. Or maybe it's some other aspect of the world that's pressing upon her. But the point is this, she can come and sit under his shadow that the, the, under the shadow of this tree, there is safety. Under the shadow of this tree, there is all sorts of provision in terms of, of refuge. And this is why the, the Lord's people run to Him and stay there, and they look back. On that moment, at that time, I, I ran under Him, and sat down under His shadow with great delight. I ran to Him for refuge. And if you think of the idea of what the tree does when people hide under trees, Again, often it's from the burning heat of the sun. That's why they sit under the tree in the first place. They go to the tree so to be protected by what's coming from above, even the burning heat of the midday sun. And if we can just pull out of that even the position of men before they hide under this apple tree, that there's a burning sun that's pressing upon them. Yes, don't, don't ever ignore the reality of it. There's a burning sun that presses upon the head of every unbeliever. And they roam around the world and they have no refuge and they have no safety from this burning sun because it's the judgment of God that hangs upon their head. It's the wrath of God they deserve for their sin. And the moment they sit down under the apple tree, they get the provision they need. It's refuge for them. Instead, the apple tree takes all of the heat of the sun. That's substitution. That's Christ standing in our place bearing it on our behalf, that sun coming upon Him instead of upon you. And if you have not run to Christ, if you have not got under the branches and the shadow of the apple tree, even Christ Himself, that's where you need to get to this morning. If your sins are still upon you, if the wrath of God still is upon your life because you haven't sought mercy and you're still in your sin and condemned and unclean, you need to run to Christ. And you see it in your mind's eye, this person seeing the apple tree in the midst of the world and running there for, for safety and for refuge. That needs to be you running to Christ. The provision is not only refuge, but as rest, is it not? Because she sat down. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. There's the rest. The rest that Christ promises in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me for rest. Come and sit down under me. Have my protecting sovereign arms over you. Know what it is to be one of mine, to be my people, and you're in my hand, and none will pluck you out of it ever. 
It's complete rest. As we indicated already, there's, there's rejoicing here as well. It's with great delight. They look back and rejoice. As she does, that they sat under the apple tree, under his shadow, with great delight. You know, you don't know the joy of salvation until you have it. There's no way of expressing it. As one old Scottish or Ulster Scots person put it, I'm not sure where they were from, but it's better felt than telt. Better felt than telt. And that's very true. Uh, this happens all the time when we have our, our suppers, and, and you, you go downstairs, and there's, there's particular things set before you, and, and some people will say, you know, try that. <laughs> you have to try that. That's Mrs. So-and-so, whatever it is. You have to try it. And what they understand is, it's not until you actually taste that you can really experience how delightful it is. And all their explanation, all them trying to explain, well, it tastes this way and that way and the other, they know the fastest way for you to understand and really grasp how wonderful it is is to taste it for yourself. And salvation in a certain sense, in a crude sense, is, is very similar like that. You can never know what it's like to have your sins forgiven and the burden lifted and sit under the apple tree and use, in, in terms of this imagery, you don't know what that's like until you actually do it. You run around the world and you're trying to find joy in everything but Christ. And you'll be miserable. At the end, you'll be miserable. Of course, there's also refreshment here, isn't there? His fruit was sweet to my taste. Refreshment. Taking of the fruit to refresh our souls. Taking of Christ Himself. Yes, He is as the apple tree, and there's fruit that's born on that apple tree. Wonderful fruit. I want you to see that fruit there. There are certain doctrines that are right there hanging on that fruit. Doctrines such as justification. Yes, that's a piece of fruit you want to pluck from that tree and taste. What it is to be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. You take that piece of fruit. And then you take another piece of fruit. Adoption. Yes, I'll take that piece of fruit. And you taste that, what it's like to be adopted into the family of God. And you meditate and you taste it and it's sweet to you. And it nourishes you. And you go through all the different doctrines of what Christ has done. You consider Him as sanctification. The fact that God is working in you. As well as you giving yourself to Him. He is working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And you take glorification and what, what it will be like, as David puts it, I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. likeness. And, you, and you consider these things, you take of those fruits, and you ponder them, and they build you up, and they strengthen you, and they help you in life. His fruit was sweet to my taste. All the benefits of the gospel. Sins forgiven. Yes, I'll take that. I will take that. Forgiveness, I'll take that piece of fruit. <laughs> I will ponder over it and cause it to be refreshing to my soul. Oh, beloved, make sure you're taking of the fruit of the apple tree today. Make sure you're doing it all the time. Do you have that saying over here, an apple a day keeps the doctor away? You say that? You know that? <laughs> There's a funny story about that concerning myself. When I was very young, I, uh, my grandfather quoted that. He said, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I think he was trying to encourage me to eat more fruit. And my quip in response to him was, uh, that this, of course this was uh, until I met Melanie, a garlic a day keeps the girlfriend away. And I don't know why my little eight, nine-year-old mind was thinking <laughs> along those lines. I shouldn't even been thinking there. But uh, that's my response at that time. But you know the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. In other words, every day, a consistent, healthy practice does benefit and will keep the doctor away. That's the idea. And so it is with the Lord. It cannot be that we simply say of the past, constantly, I sat down under His shadow with great delight and His fruit was sweet to my taste. It was all in the past and I'm not doing it today. 
You know what happens then? Malnutrition. What happens then? You get yourself into a state and condition where you're not really going on with God and you're not growing and you're not advancing in grace. And you're left malnourished and you're wondering why you're depressed and you're wondering why you're not going on with God and why, you, and why the joy seems to be so distant. It's all the past. is just joy way back then. And the reason is you're not taking of the fruit of the apple tree. You're not meditating upon Christ and taking, yes, yes, taking the doctrine of, of the forgiveness of sins and, and adoption and, and sanctification and glorification and so on and so forth. You're not taking of those doctrines and tasting them regularly. You're not in the Word. You're not, not seeking to be nourished in the things of Christ. Of course, this is part of my job, isn't it? There are some apples that you can't reach. <laughs> you struggle to reach them. Maybe you read this passage and you wonder, what's he going to say? <laughs> what's he going to preach from this passage? And my, my job, the job of the preacher, even the job of parents toward their children at times, is to, is to be in that apple tree, climbing, reaching up into that apple tree, and taking all that fruit and handing it to others. It's seeking for you to be nourished up, to, to reach those apples down to your soul to nourish you in the things of Christ, to help you to feed upon the things that are good for you. That's why the Lord has appointed preachers. And I hope it's sweet to your taste. <laughs> he brought me, verse 4, to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. The house of wine, as it can be translated. The house of wine, wine symbolic of the blood of Christ, symbolic of sacrifice, symbolic of the offering made by Jesus Christ upon Calvary. He brought me to the banqueting house. He brings me into that place where the wine flows. And his banner over me was love. The banner often is used in military terms. But here it's a banner of love, of peace, of acceptance. And Christ brings his people in. Look at verse 4, child of God. Look at it. He brings me into his house of wine. He brings me into that place and reminds me. He reminds me that the blood has been shed. That, that the sacrifice has taken place. That the once for all offering for sin has been presented before the Father and accepted by the Father. And so you can come into the banqueting house. And the banner, rather than being one of aggression, one that condemns you, is one of love and acceptance. Wonderful. Thirdly, very quickly, the imagery of security is verses 5 through 7. Because she says, Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. There is a petition that she offers here. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples. What's she saying here? What are flagons? Well, it's, it's something that was made of the grape, basically. And again, you have this, this imagery of grapes, just as we've seen before. Uh, grapes are, are through this passage, back up in chapter 1, verses, verse 14 particularly. There's this emphasis upon the grape. And here it is again, stay me with flagons like cake made with grapes, something of that nature. <coughs> and she is want <coughs> wanting to be kept by that. Stay me with that. In other words, help me to know security with that. If you can see the sense of security in the language of her petition, I want to be stayed with a sense of what it is you present me, which is this, these cake of grapes. Again, it's indicating the sacrifice of Christ, the blood that's shed. It's all, it's all points forward to what the Lamb would offer in the shedding of His blood. Comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. 
She senses her powerlessness. She is so in love that she is without power. I am sick. I am weak with love. Overwhelmed trying to grasp what you have done for me. Overwhelmed. I, when I read this, I just think again of that woman in, in Luke chapter 7. I can't. She comes to mind so often when I see someone overwhelmed with a sense of the love of Christ. There she is, being criticized, being overly emotional, and Simon, of course, criticizing because, you know, if the Lord Jesus really was a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is. And the Lord knows everything about it. And instead of her being driven away, she is encouraged. She, she, is, she is called to stay. She has that sense that, your sins are forgiven. That's what the Lord says. Your, your sins are forgiven. She is comforted with a sense of the gospel. And she, here, the church is looking for that comfort and for that sense of security with the gospel. And as depicted in verse 6, in this language, his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. You see, you see the closeness the Lord holds his church, how he holds, how he holds his people. Beloved, when, you, when it feels like you're alone, when it feels like you're going through life and the Lord is not paying attention to you, it's not true. Scripture is replete with references. Some are, are explicit. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Other are, are more graphic in terms of imagery. Like this, that his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. Language again, like we've quoted already, that, that even the very hairs of her head are numbered. I'm not a bird falls from the sky, but our Father knoweth the Lord's attention toward us. And so here, she is seeking for this, and she enjoys it and experiences. His left hand is under my head. His right hand doth embrace me. The security of the believer. You can draw it out in terms of eternal security. You will never fall, ever. Once in Christ, once under the apple tree, once you've tasted of the fruit of the gospel, you will never be driven away. You're His. You belong to Him. He has called you unto Himself. As a, as a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. They, my love, that's what He says. You're my love. We love Him because He first loved us. And when you come to the table, it's not, it's not about the Lord saying, first and foremost, what are you going to offer me? There's part of that involved. There's part of that that we reciprocate, but it is a reciprocity from us because of what He has first done. The table of the Lord reminds you not of what you need to be and do, but what He has done. The table is a reminder of the fact that His left hand is under your head and His right hand embraces you. It's a reminder of acceptance. The fact that you're known and you're loved and you're cared for. You're saved. You belong to Him. You will never play or perish. Neither will any pluck you out of His hand. You belong to Christ. And her only, her only fear is that He would be driven away. I think that's the sense of verse 7. I charge you, the church would say, to those observe, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Don't, don't drive him away. The rose and the hinds are, are very sensitive creatures. If they sense the slightest threat, they are gone. And if I'm understanding it right, her charge to those around is saying, do not in any way drive away my love. Don't drive him away. As much as we are secure, as much as we belong to him and will never perish, there can be, as already was experienced by her, a distance that is created between her and the Lord. And she is desperate for that not to occur. Don't drive him away. Paul, Paul feels the same thing, does he not? This is why he exhorts, quench not the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't do anything to, to hinder the sense and activity of the Spirit of God in your life. 
Don't be ignorant of the fact that you can, you can drive away the sweet influences of the Spirit that Christ would send for your benefit and for your good. You can drive that away. If we need any evidence of that, we need only read the letters that were written to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The Laodicean church, Christ already outside the door. He had been driven away. He'd even start to knock at the door. After having been driven away, he comes and he stands at the door and he knocks. He's calling out to those that profess love for his name. He's calling out to them, come back, come back. But they are so headstrong, they are so steeped in the folly of their ways, in the church this is, they can't even hear the knock of Christ. You know, they and if they are hearing it, they're ignoring it. I like to think rather they didn't hear the knock, but if they did hear it, they're ignoring it. And so he has to send a letter. He has to get John to send a letter to the church at Laodicea to tell them, first, you've driven Christ out and you're ignoring His knock. You don't even hear Him knocking. You're not even listening. As He beckons, if any man hear my voice, open the door. I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Where are you spiritually this morning? I trust that you are sitting under the apple tree with great delight and enjoying the fruit of the gospel. That's ideal. <laughs> you're a lily among thorns. You're in this world. But you're sitting under the apple tree. You're there for refuge and for rest and for refreshment, and you're enjoying the gospel, and you have all the right and privilege to come to the table and enjoy the gospel, to enjoy what Jesus Christ has done for you. But is that the case for everyone this morning? I do not know. The encouragement is, if you know the Lord, if you have tasted of the fruit of the gospel, if you belong to Him, even though you may have gotten away and you have run and neglected the Lord, you've, 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 you've not been tasting of the, the sweetness of the fruit of the gospel, you're not reading the Word, you're not praying, you're not, you're not doing anything. I mean, it's nearly a miracle that you're even here today, given how you're living at present. I trust you'll come and you'll flee under the apple tree. And let the table be what it is designed to be, a reminder. A reminder. It reminds you today that Christ has lived and died and rose again. It's a reminder that it's not about what you can do, it's about what He has done. It's a reminder that to receive the benefits of the gospel, they are received by faith. What are you doing when you participate in a meal that you did not prepare you're reaping the benefits of someone else's labor. Jesus Christ gives you the bread. He gives you the cup. And He simply says, taste and enjoy the benefits of my work. And no matter how sinful you are, no matter how sinful you have been, no matter what your history, checkered as it might be, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come to Christ this day. Seek Him for mercy. Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> in
again, the fact that we are observing the, the Lord's table does not mean that any of you should feel a need to leave or depart. Even if you're not saved, the only caution I give you is that if you're not in fellowship with Christ, you're not in a position where you want to have fellowship with Christ, then don't participate. Just sit there and think about, think about your soul. Think about eternity. Think about the fact there is but a step between you and death. None of us are sure of even seeing the next communion season. It's time to seek the Lord. Father, we are thankful for the imagery given to us in this portion that paints for us a scene of Thy love shown toward Thy people. We pray that Thou wilt help our eyes to see Christ as the lily of the valley and as the rose of Sharon. We pray that we might see Him for the glory and the wonder of who He is and what He has done. And our appreciation would be heightened every day Help then each one of us that participate in this table. Encourage us, O Lord, and grant that our hearts may be drawn out afresh to love Thee, knowing that Thou hast first loved us. Draw near in Jesus' name. Amen.